Even inexperienced managers know that planning and decision making are central parts of their jobs. Let's take a look at the benefits of planning. Planning offers several important benefits, intensified effort, persistence, direction, and creation of task strategies. First, managers and employees put forth greater effort when following a plan. Second, planning leads to persistence, that is, working harder for longer periods. In fact, planning encourages persistence even when there may be little chance of short-term success. The third benefit of planning is direction. The fourth benefit of planning is that it encourages the development of task strategies. In other words, planning not only encourages people to work hard for extended periods and to engage in behavior directly related to goal accomplishment, it also encourages them to think of better ways to do their jobs. Finally, perhaps the most compelling benefit of planning is that it's been proven to work for both companies and individuals. On average, companies with plans have larger profits and grow much faster than companies without plans. The same holds true for individual managers and employees. There is no better way to improve the performance of the people who work in a company than to give them a set of goals and develop strategies for achieving those goals. Plans won't fix all organizational problems. In fact, many management authors and consultants believe that planning can harm companies in several ways. The first pitfall of planning is that it can impede change and prevent or slow needed adaption. Sometimes companies become so committed to achieving the goals set forth in their plans or on following the strategies and tactics spelled out for them that they fail to see that their plans aren't working or that their goals need to change. The second pitfall is that planning can create a false sense of certainty. Planners sometimes feel that they know exactly what the future holds for their organizations, their suppliers, and their companies. However, all plans are based on assumptions. The third pitfall of planning is the detachment of planners. In theory, strategic planners and top-level managers are supposed to focus on the big picture and not concern themselves with the details of implementation, that is, carrying out the plan. Detachment leads planners to plan for things they don't understand. Plans are meant to be guidelines for actions, not abstract theories. Consequently, planners need to be familiar with the daily details of their business if they're to produce plans that can work. Planning is a double-edged sword. If done right, planning brings about tremendous increases in individual and organizational performance. If planning is done wrong, however, it can have just the opposite effect and harm individual and organization performance. The first step in planning is to set goals. To direct behavior and increase effort, goals need to be specific and challenging. One way to write effective goals for yourself, your job, or your organization is to use SMART guidelines. SMART goals are specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. Just because a company sets a goal doesn't mean that people will try to accomplish it. If workers don't care about a goal, the goal won't encourage them to work harder or smarter. Thus, the second step in planning is to develop commitment to goals. Goal commitment is the determination to achieve a goal. Commitment to achieve a goal is not automatic. Managers and workers must choose to commit themselves to a goal. So how can managers bring about goal commitment? The most popular approach is to set goals participatively. Rather than assigning goals to workers, managers and employees choose goals together. The goals are more likely to be realistic and attainable if employees participate in setting them. Another technique for gaining commitment to a goal is to make the goal public. A third step in planning is to develop effective action plans. An action plan lists the specific steps, the how, people, the who, resources, the what, and the time period, the when, for accomplishing a goal. The fourth step in planning is to track progress towards goal achievement. There are two accepted methods of tracking progress. The first is to set proximal goals and distal goals. Proximal goals are short-term goals or sub-goals, whereas distal goals are long-term or primary goals. 
Because action plans are sometimes poorly conceived and goals sometimes turn out not to be achievable, the last step in developing an effective plan is to maintain flexibility. One method of maintaining flexibility while planning is to adopt an options-based approach. The goal of an options-based planning approach is to keep options open by making small, simultaneous investments in many alternative plans. Then, when one or a few of these plans emerge as a likely winner, you invest more in those plans while discontinuing or reducing investment in the others. In other words, planning works best when everybody pulls in the same direction. Top management is responsible for developing long-term strategic plans that make clear how the company will serve customers and position itself against competitors in the next two to five years. Strategic planning begins with the creation of an organizational purpose. A purpose statement, which is often referred to as an organizational mission or vision, is a statement of a company's purpose or reason of existing. Purpose statements should be brief, no more than two sentences. They also should be enduring, inspirational, clear, and consistent with widely shared company beliefs and values. The strategic objective, which flows from the purpose, is a more specific goal that unifies company-wide efforts, stretches and challenges the organization, and possesses a finish line and a time frame. Middle management is responsible for developing and carrying out tactical plans to accomplish the organization's strategic objective. Tactical plans specify how a company will use resources, budgets, and people to accomplish specific goals related to its strategic objective for the next five years. Management by objective is a management technique often used to develop and carry out tactical plans. Management by objectives is a four-step process in which managers and their employees first discuss possible goals, Second, collectively select goals that are challenging, attainable, and consistent with the company's overall goals. Third, jointly develop tactical plans that lead to the accomplishment of tactical goals and objectives. And fourth, meet regularly to review progress towards accomplishment of those goals. Lower-level managers are responsible for developing and carrying out operational plans, which are the day-to-day -day plans for producing or delivering the organization's products or services. Operational plans direct the behavior, efforts, and priorities of operative employees for periods ranging from 30 days to 6 months. There are three kinds of operational plans, single-use plans, standing plans, and budgets. Single-use plans deal with unique, one-time-only events. Unlike single-use plans that are created, carried out once, and then never used again, standing plans save managers time because after the plans are created, they can be used repeatedly to handle frequently reoccurring events. If you encounter a problem that you've seen before, someone in your company has probably written a standing plan that explains how to address it. Policies indicate the general course of action the company manager should take in response to a particular event or situation. A well-written policy will also specify why the policy exists and what outcome the policy is intended to produce. Procedures are more specific than policies because they indicate the series of steps that should be taken in response to a particular event. All commercial airplanes require regular cleaning. With no regulatory standards, airlines set their own procedures for the cleaning process. Rules and regulations are even more specific than procedures because they specify what must happen or not happen. They describe precisely how a particular action should be performed. After single-use plans and standing plans, budgets are the third kind of operational plan. Budgeting is a quantifiable planning process because it forces managers to decide how to allocate available money to best accomplish company goals. Rational decision-making is a systematic process in which managers define problems, evaluate alternatives, and choose optimal solutions that provide maximum benefits to their organizations. The first step in decision-making is identifying and defining the problem. A problem exists when there's a gap between a desired state, what is wanted, and an existing state, the situation you're currently facing. 
The presence of a gap between an existing state and a desired state is no guarantee that managers will make decisions to solve problems. Three things must occur for this to happen. Being aware of a problem isn't enough to begin the decision-making process. Managers have to be motivated to reduce the gap between the desired and existing state. It's not enough to be aware of a problem and be motivated to solve it. Managers must also have the knowledge, skills, abilities, and resources to fix the problem. Decision criteria are the standards used to guide judgments and decisions. Typically, the more criteria a potential solution meets, the better that solution will be. After identifying decision criteria, the next step is deciding which criteria are more or less important. Although there are numerous mathematical models for weighing decision criteria, all require the decision maker to provide an initial ranking of the criteria. Some use absolute comparisons, in which each criterion is compared with a standard or is ranked on its own merits. After identifying and weighing the criteria that will guide the decision-making process, the next step is to identify possible courses of actions that could solve the problem. In general, at this step, the idea is to generate as many alternatives as possible. The next step is to systematically evaluate each alternative against each criterion. Because of the amount of information that must be collected, this step can take much longer and be much more expensive than other steps in the decision-making process. No matter how you gather the information, once you have it, the key is to use that information systematically to evaluate each alternative against each criterion. The final step in the decision-making process is to compute the optimal decision by determining the optimal value for each alternative. This can be done by multiplying the ranking for each criterion and the weight that criterion holds, and then summing those scores for each alternative course of action that you generated. In general, managers who diligently complete all six steps of the rational decision-making model will make better decisions than those who don't. So, when they can, managers should try to follow the steps in the rational decision-making model, especially for big decisions with long-range consequences. In theory, fully rational decision makers maximize decisions by choosing the optimal solution. In practice, however, limited resources along with attention, memory, and expertise problems make it nearly impossible for managers to maximize decisions. Consequently, most managers don't maximize, they satisfice. Whereas maximizing is choosing the best alternative, satisficing is choosing a good enough alternative. In other words, groups were used to solve problems and make decisions. Companies rely so heavily on groups to make decisions because when done properly, group decision making can lead to much better decisions than those typically made by individuals. In fact, numerous studies show that groups consistently outperform individuals on complex tasks. Groups can do a much better job than individuals in two important steps of the decision-making process, defining the problem and generating alternative solutions. One possible pitfall is groupthink. Groupthink occurs in a highly cohesive group when group members feel intense pressure to agree with each other so that the group can approve a proposed solution. Because groupthink leads to consideration of a limited number of solutions and restricts discussion of any considered solutions, it usually results in poor decisions. Groupthink is likely to occur under the following conditions. The group is insulated from others with a different perspective. The group leader begins by expressing a strong preference for a particular decision. The group has no established procedure for systematically defining problems and exploring alternatives, and group members have similar backgrounds and experiences. A second potential problem with group decision-making is that it takes considerable time. Reconciling schedules so that group members can meet takes time. Furthermore, it's rare that a group consistently holds productive, task-oriented meetings to effectively work through the decision-making process. Some of the most common complaints about meetings, and thus group decision-making, are that meetings' purpose are unclear, participants are underprepared, critical people are absent or late, conversation doesn't stay focused on the problem, and no one follows up on the decisions that were made. 
A third possible pitfall to group decision making is that sometimes one or two people, perhaps the boss or a strong-willed vocal group member, can dominate the discussions and limit the group's consideration of different problem definitions and alternative solutions. This may be more likely to happen when subject matter experts are part of groups. The pitfall is that subject matter experts dominate and limit group discussion as non-experts in the group defer to expert judgment. Doing so often results in much poorer quality decisions. And unlike individual decisions where people feel personally responsible for making a good choice, another potential problem is that group members may not feel accountable for the decisions made and the actions taken by the group. Ironically, a fourth pitfall of group decision making is a quality bias, which causes individuals to treat all group members as equally competent. More highly competent people tend to underestimate their abilities, while less competent people overestimate theirs. C-type conflict, or cognitive conflict, focuses on problem and issue-related differences of opinion. In C-type conflict, group members disagree because their different experiences and expertise lead them to view the problem and its potential solutions differently. C-type conflict is also characterized by a willingness to examine, compare, and reconcile those differences to produce the best possible solution. By contrast, A-type conflict, meaning effective conflict, refers to the emotional reactions that can occur when disagreements become personal rather than professional. A-type conflict often results in hostility, anger, resentment, distrust, cynicism, and apathy. Unlike C-type conflict, A-type conflict undermines team effectiveness by preventing teams from engaging in the activities characteristic of a C-type conflict that are critical to team effectiveness. The devil's advocacy approach can be used to create C-type conflict by assigning an individual a subgroup or role of a critic. The following five steps establish a devil's advocacy program. First, generate a potential solution. Second, assign a devil's advocate to criticize and question the solution. Third, present the critique of the potential solution to key decision makers. Fourth, gather additional relevant information. And fifth and finally, decide whether to use, change, or not use the originally proposed solution. When properly used, the devil's advocacy approach introduces C-type conflict into the decision-making process. Contrary to the common belief that conflict is bad, studies show that these methods lead not only to a less A-type conflict, but also to improved decision quality and greater acceptance of decisions after they've been made. Another method of creating C-type conflict is dialectical inquiry, which creates C-type conflict by forcing decision makers to state the assumptions of a proposed solution, a thesis, and then generate a solution that is the opposite, the antithesis, of the proposed solution. Accordingly, the nominal group technique, known as the NGT, received its name because it begins with a quiet time in which group members independently write down as many problem definitions and alternative solutions as possible. In other words, the NGT begins by having group members act as individuals. After the quiet time, the group leader asks each member to share one idea at a time with the group. As they're read aloud, ideas are posted on flip charts or whiteboards for all to see. This step continues until all ideas have been shared. In the next step, the group discusses the advantages and disadvantages of the ideas. The NGT closes with a second quiet time in which group members independently rank the ideas presented. Group members then read their rankings aloud and the idea with the highest average rank is selected. The nominal group technique improves group decision making by decreasing A-type conflict, but it also restricts C-type conflict. Nonetheless, more than 80 studies have found the nominal group technique to produce better ideas than those produced by traditional groups. In the Delphi technique, the members of a panel of experts respond to questions and to each other until reaching agreement on an issue. The first step is to assemble a panel of experts. Unlike other approaches to group decision making, however, it isn't necessarily to bring the panel members together in one place. 
Because the Delphi technique does not require the experts to leave their offices or disrupt their schedules, they're more likely to participate. The second step is to create a questionnaire consisting of a series of open-ended questions for the group. In the third step, group members' written responses are analyzed, summarized, and fed back to the group for reactions until members reach agreement. Asking group members why they agree or disagree is important because it helps uncover their unstated assumptions and beliefs. Again, this process of summarizing panel feedback and obtaining reactions to that feedback continues until the panel members reach agreement. Brainstorming, in which group members build on others' ideas, is a technique for generating a number of alternative solutions. Brainstorming has four rules. The more ideas, the better. All ideas are acceptable, no matter how wild or crazy they might seem. Other group members' ideas should be used to come up with even more ideas. And criticism or evaluation of ideas is not allowed. Although brainstorming is great fun and can help managers generate a large number of alternative solutions, it does have a number of disadvantages. Fortunately, electronic brainstorming in which group members use computers to communicate and generate alternative solutions overcomes the disadvantages associated with face-to-face -face brainstorming. The first disadvantage that electronic brainstorming overcomes is production blocking, which occurs when you have an idea but have to wait to share it because someone else is already presenting an idea to the group. During this short delay, you may forget the idea or decide that it really wasn't worth sharing. Production blocking doesn't happen with electronic brainstorming. All group members are seated at computers, so everyone can type in their ideas whenever they occur. There's no waiting for your turn to be heard by the group. The second disadvantage that electronic brainstorming overcomes is evaluation apprehension, that is, being afraid of what others will think of your ideas. With electronic brainstorming, all ideas are anonymous. When you type in the idea and press the Enter key to share it with the group, group members see only the idea. Furthermore, many brainstorming software programs also protect anonymity by displaying ideas in random order. Studies show that electronic brainstorming is much more productive than face-to-face -face brainstorming. Four-person electronic brainstorming groups produce 25 to 50% more ideas than four-person regular brainstorming groups, and 12-person electronic brainstorming groups produce 200% more ideas than regular groups of the same size.